Hello everybody and welcome to today's webcast, Pave the Way, Build a Value-Driven SAP GRC Roadmap. My name is Jamie Draper. I'm a partner with PwC based out of San Francisco and part of our national SAP assurance practice specializing in security and controls. I'm joined today by David Hodson and Jonathan Levitt. I'll give a bigger introduction to those two, but first I need to go through some administrative matters for the presentation. So the first thing is a, a disclaimer, very important to uh, anybody who's on the call who's one, uh, one of our external audit clients. Certain matters reviewed today may represent services that PwC may be prohibited from providing to our audit clients. In those circ instances, the information is being provided to inform you of options that you may want to consider as you evaluate the solution described on today's webcast. Due to the complexity of the independence rules, any potential services for our audit clients should be discussed in advance within the context of the independence rules. The information contained in this document is provided as is for general guidance on matters of interest only. PricewaterhouseCoopers is not herein engaged in rendering legal, accounting, tax, or other professional advice and services. Before making any decision or taking any action, you, could consult a, you should consult a competent professional advisor. Next, uh, a great slide for um, talking about how to get a better viewing and, and, and sound experience. Obviously, if you can't hear or see anything, you won't be able to hear or see what's going on right now. Um, but for those of you uh, who can do one or the other, um, for better viewing experience, close other applications. For better sound quality, use headphones. To enlarge the slides, click the bottom right corner of the slide window and drag to the desired size. Um, a question we get asked all the time, uh, can you download today's presentation? Yes, you can. Click on the resources widget at the bottom of the screen and you should be able to download it from there. Uh, the next thing, very important, want people to ask questions as we go through the presentation. So if you submit your questions, use the Q&A window on the left side of your screen. Um, we will answer all questions. We may not get to all of them during the webcast itself, but what we will do is we'll reply by email if there are questions. Also, if there are questions that are specific to your environment, which is likely to, be hap likely to happen, please ask them, but we're probably not going to answer those on the webcast and we'll sort of stick to the questions that are around general themes and topics. Uh, and last, if you have any uh, technical difficulties um, during the polling questions, and I'll cover the CPE questions on the next slide, Please answer the question in the Q&A with your answer option, and that way you can still receive the, the, receive the CPE credits. So moving to CPE itself, in order to get CPE credits, you have to be on for the entire 60 minutes. You have to respond to the polling questions, and we'll ask polling questions in each 15-minute segment. There's actually five. There'll be two polling questions together at the beginning. Um, at the end, you need to click the CPE widget um, on conclusion of the webcast at the bottom of the screen and follow the prompts. And last, CPE can't be awarded, unfortunately, for participants not, lo not logged on to the webcasters themselves or if you're viewing a replay. So that's the administrative matters. And to the, to the agenda to, to today's webcast on how to, how to build a GRC roadmap, uh, we've done an introduction. Um, I'll do a brief introduction of, of David Hodson and Jonathan Levitt who are joining me. David is an, a director out of our Atlanta office. Um, he's, he's got over 10 years of experience with SAP security and controls, and he does have a, quite a bit of experience doing GRC roadmaps, uh, particularly in the food and beverage industry where he's, uh, he's got quite a lot of recent experience. Jonathan Levitt uh, is based in Orange County. He's a manager who works very closely with myself. Uh, he's also got over 10 years of experience in security and controls and got experience developing roadmaps for, for clients with uh, the SAP GRC or SAP GRC solutions. It doesn't have to be SAP GRC solution itself. Um, he's got a lot of experience recently in the media and entertainment industry and retail and consumer. So with that, moving to what we're going to cover on today's presentation, um, we're going to start with looking at how you measure GRC progression and benchmarking. So when we look at the components of GRC that we typically see implemented, where are you on that? 
then we're going to look at how what, what a GRC program roadmap is. So what, what does a roadmap look like? Then talk about how you build a, a business case for that, and then look at some different approaches, whether you should take a pilot approach or go with a big bang. And last at the end, we have a case study that you can read uh, if you download the slides. So after having gone through that, that, that agenda, the objective of the, of the webcast today really is to, to help you understand what, what's involved with a, 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 a GRC roadmap, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you put a business case together, and how do you navigate your organization to get support for moving a GRC program uh, uh, in your organization? And so hopefully you'll, you'll get a lot of um, tips on this. And as I said, please, please ask any questions in the Q&A, and we'll try and answer those as we go along. And with that, I'll hand over to David to take on the next section. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks everybody for joining today. Um, so, as Jamie just mentioned on the agenda, where, where we thought would make the most sense to start the discussion off is uh, is, is really just um, setting some context for for where you you and your organization might be today um, in terms of of what your GRC capabilities are, uh, both from a technical uh, uh, I guess really two dimensions. The, the first one being um, what are your supporting technical capabilities, and then second. Um, what does your controls uh, matrix look like? How, op how optimizes it in terms of uh, the automation? So um, this first uh, slide that you see here, measuring GRC progression, is really around um, what your technical capabilities are at your company. And so as you look down the, the bottom axis, you'll see a lot of different capabilities listed. And these are really just the, the typical sequence in which we see companies often implement um, GRC tech, their GRC technical capabilities. There's no hard and fast rules around this, obviously, but um, starting all the way from the left to, to really not having any technical capabilities, we move to these uh, yellow boxes that you see here, which are really uh, all security focused. So uh, we have uh, things like, uh, you know, starting off having a tool that enables you to do uh, detective SOD and sensitive access reviews is, is where a lot of companies start. And then from there, companies may uh, get smart enough so that they could actually preventatively check for SODs with their access tool prior to provisioning access. And from there, they may go on to an emergency access management solution um, and then all the way uh, to the, uh, the far end of the spectrum in terms of security they may have implemented a job-based security role model where SODs are pre-approved for those jobs and, um, you know, things operate very efficiently. So uh, that's, that's really the, that first section of boxes you see there. Companies do usually start um, on the security side, we find, and then um, will often from there turn their attention to more of the process control side. So you're looking at the business process controls. And so just to talk through those capabilities to, to give you an idea of, of what's out there and what companies do. The first step a lot of times is just getting um, your controls in a, uh, a formalized repository within a tool. So sort of moving from uh, maybe just um, Excel files on a, on a SharePoint site to actually having um, a tool where you, you uh, your, your controls are almost treated like master data inside of a tool like SAP GRC process controls. Um, and then from there, you may actually, for all of your controls, get your test plans in there in terms of how those controls are going to execute. Um, and then just moving right along the continuum, um, you may have some linkage then from your controls and their effectiveness back to your access control solution. Um, and, and then really getting all the way sort of to the right there, uh, just implementing business rules through a tool like SAP GRC process controls where um, you, you actually have hooks into your ERP system where you can do things like monitor config, um, set up real-time alerts if something in the system changes, uh, monitoring master data and transactional data. Um, so, you know, basically what this chart is just trying to explain that the, the greater your technical capabilities, the, you know, the more maturity you can build into your system um, and, and the more you can do with your controls. So with that, we're going to move to, uh, I believe, the first polling question for the day. So I'll turn it back to you, Jamie. 
Thanks, David. So we've actually got two polling questions very close together at the beginning, just to establish a baseline of where everybody is. The first question, where do you fit on the GRC progression scale? So A, no GRC solution implemented. B, some GRC solutions implemented. Or C, a comprehensive set of GRC solutions implemented. Um, so really, like I say, we're, we're just going to ask two uh, very quick questions back to back to get an understanding of where everybody is who's on the call, um, you know, to, to, to help us sort of understand, you know, whether people have got a very mature GRC program in place or whether you're at the beginning of a journey. So I'll just allow a, a few more seconds uh, to, and we'll look at the results of, of this one and then I'll, I'll start answering some questions when we, when we get to the next question. Okay, I'm going to put the results on the screen. So what we see is about 58% have got some GRC implemented, about 30% don't have a GRC solution, and 12% have a comprehensive solution. And that's probably a reasonable spread on what we would expect to see. I think, you know, as David was saying on that, uh, on that spectrum, we often see that, that companies have I've got some form of tool, whether it's SAP GRC or another product, to look at uh, segregation of duties to help manage uh, segregation of duties. So having some kind of start to, to GRC, but not fully expanding across the, uh, the, the full potential that GRC can provide. So we're going to jump straight into a second um, polling question. What percentage of your controls are automated within your landscape? A, 0 to 25%, B, or 0 to 25%, uh, B, 25% to 50%, C, 50% to 75%, D, 75% and above, E, I'm not sure. Um, if you want to just hit that. And then what, one question that came in um, just prior to, to, to the webcast was, was one on, What's, what GRC solutions out, are out there that, that, that you see? And we're not really trying to get into the GRC technology itself. And when we sort of cover the roadmap, we'll talk about a good point at which it is to evaluate the technology once you've decided what path you're going to move down. I think from a high level, I'd, I'd throw out, you know, common tools that I see that are uh, a, a more broad-based from a, a broader GRC perspective from larger GRC programs are Archer, Metric, Stream, and BWISE. And then when I look at tools that, that are very focused on SAP and have got more transactional analysis capabilities, it's really SAP's GRC approver and control panel that we're, that we're seeing quite a lot. There are plenty of other tools on the market. That, that's not the list. That just is you know, a question that came in, and that's just sort of what I'm seeing. Um, and so with that, I will push the poll results for the next question. Okay, so seeing a, a high percentage of people with very low automated controls, um, I'm, I'm going to sort of guess that the, the folks that aren't sure that are out there probably don't have very high automated controls. Typ typically, the organizations that have got a high level of automation um, are uh, uh, generally know, know their control footprint. And so that, that, that's going to take us to, to the next slide where we're going to talk about, um, you, you know, some, some benchmarking and what we've seen of companies and sort of where you can start from and where you can go if you want to improve your control automation in your organization. Great. Thanks, Jamie. So um, I'll, I'll just take a second to explain this chart because I'll be honest, the first time I saw it, I did, I did not make this slide. Uh, it, it took me a minute to catch on to it. But um, really what we're showing here is uh, we have the, uh, along the left vertical axis, that, that's representing the number of controls at all of these nine different companies in which the, the benchmarking was done. Um, along the right axis, you'll see uh, vertical axis, you'll see the, these percentages. So the triangles that you see along here for each company are corresponding to this right axis, vertical axis with regards to the percentage of the automated controls that each of the company has. And then, um, you know, the, the, the size of the bars are corresponding to the number of controls that you see here um, on the left. So um, 
you know, re really what it's trying to, to demonstrate is that, you know, most companies, um, the average number of controls that they've automated is, is typically under 30%, which I think is um, consistent with the uh, answers that we just saw in the, the last polling question. Um, and so we're just going to talk a minute about uh, the benefits of um, automating your controls as you kind of think about where your organization is. Um, obviously, um, uh, you know, mo most companies that have put in the, an investment for a system like SAP, a, a large ERP like SAP or Oracle, um, when they've done that, they've, they've gotten a solution that is um, highly configurable and and they often gain an opportunity right when they make that investment and implement a system like that to, to take their controls to a more automated state just by the nature of how those systems um, work and, and how standardized they are and how configurable they are um, with, the, you know, the integrated solution across all of your, your processes. So, um, you know, the reason why that's, that's such a great opportunity to take advantage of, and, and most of this is somewhat common sense, but um, automated controls uh, take less time to operate. Um, so there's typically a lower cost um, associated with, with owning automated controls and operating automated controls. Um, in addition to that, they're going to be less prone to human error, and in a lot of ways, um, they can be stronger than manual controls in that sometimes if, if it's like a real-time notification or something like that that you set up, um, you may be notified of an issue um, that same day rather than, you know, waiting till a month in reconciliation or, or something along those lines. And, you know, it's been 25 days since the issue happened, and, and then you're having to go back for that whole period to, to analyze the results. So, um, you know, it, it, I think, you know, most folks from a controls background will understand um, the need uh, for, for building in more automation um, for, to, to their control matrix. I think uh, one other point we just wanted to make with regards to this slide is um, in terms of adding automation into your control environment, you know, you can still um, benefit from automation even if it's at the end of the day still a manual control. So, you know, we sometimes use the term uh, semi-automated control. And so um, there are tools out there that can make your manual controls more efficient. So um, we, we can maybe talk about that a little bit um, further down the road um, as, as we go through the presentation. Um, but once again, the idea of this first section is to just give you some, some context um, and, and let, let you kind of think through where your organization is from a controls perspective, both in terms of the technical capabilities and the amount of automation you have with regards to your controls matrix. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Jonathan, for the next section. Actually, just before we move to, to, to Jonathan, I'm just going to jump in because there was a, a couple of questions coming in about that last chart asking whether they were business and IT controls. It, it's all of the controls of an organization, so it includes business and IT controls. Um, so it's, it, it, it's, it, it's really the controls that a company is monitoring, so it's, it's generally focused on those SOX controls that people have got um, and, and does cover both business, finance, and IT. So I just wanted to clear that because there's quite a few questions coming in. Okay, Jonathan. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, so now we're going to go into an example of the GRC program roadmap. So implementing a single consolidated strategy for GRC um, can be extremely challenging, in particular for organizations with large and complex landscapes. These challenges could potentially originate from, for example, the risk environment not being continuously re-evaluated, alignment between risks, controls, and processes being lost over time, control requirements varying from one business unit to another, and or, or organization change. But basically, as the control environment becomes ever more complex to manage, in part due to uh, the increasing external threats and an ever-growing risk of internal threats such as fraud, we see that organizations are developing a more strategic approach to SAP risk, security, and controls, and attempting to integrate this into a broader GRC strategy. Um, what this roadmap example intends to achieve is establishing a long-term vision for your SAP risk and security and controls environment that takes into account not only the technical elements but also the processes and people required to support a sustainable strategy. It is important to note that this roadmap should be developed in alignment with uh, you know, the wider SAP or IT and business strategy. So, uh, I mean, we're going we're gonna to dive deeper into each of these five steps, but 
at a high level, one would start by assessing your current risk environment from a completeness perspective, the results of which would flow through to the alignment of your controls to these updated risks, and then or parallel to, um, parallel to phase two or, or, or following, you know, phase three really intends to identify opportunities to enhance or optimize your processes and controls. And then step four, this includes the introduction of or enhancement to GRC technologies that would enable you to realize the opportunities identified in phase three. And finally, the GRC program maintenance, ensuring your risks and your controls environment maintain relevance and is, a, uh, is effectively uh, sustainable. So saying that, let's move, let's, let's dig deeper into each of these steps. Uh, just to be sure we're all on the same page, a brief inter introduction into the risk assessment. So the risk assessment really provides a mechanism for identifying and evaluating events. Such events, you know, these can be identified in the external environment, such as a regulatory landscape, but also within the organization's internal environment. Basically, when these events kind of intersect with an organization's objectives, they become risks. Risk, I would say, can therefore be defined as you know, the possibility that an event will occur and adversely affect the achievement of the organization's objectives or initiatives. So done right, the risk, uh, risk assessment will give the organization a clear view of the scenarios to which they may be exposed and accurately represent the risks of an organization. Basically, you, you, don't want to, you don't want to over control, so tailoring that risk profile um, of the organization is crucial. So this, in, in essence, forms the foundation of an effective GRC program and the basis for the control analysis and the design decisions in the subsequent phases of the project. So what do we see? Um, yeah, really, we have experienced organizations that have focused specifically on regulatory requirements, a disconnect between the risk assessment and the GRC environment. And in some instances, the risk assessment is not granular, uh, granular enough to provide actionable activities. So uh, really, uh, the, the recommendations from this uh, phase is, you know, the risk assessment should ideally cover compliance objectives as well as those operational objectives. And this is really to achieve more value for the business. But really, you need to figure out the priorities as an organization and what you can realistically achieve. If, if, if a small centralized organization, an enterprise-wide assessment may be achievable, but a global organization with many business units, it may be near impossible to get buy-in. So some organizations tend to kind of collapse under their own weight, so perhaps recognize what, is what are the important compliance needs and focus on that first to, to get underway. Also, um, I mean, in, in essence, to summarize, basically understand who you are and what works best. Uh, also, the assessment must be granular enough to enable the organization to develop an effective response and form that link with, uh, linkage to the SAP controls and processes. So the, uh, the advantages of this, doing this before anything else, you know, it ensures risks, are not rele uh, risks, risks that are not relevant and not taking up any time, it ensures that the business, internal order and compliance all have a common understanding about what is relevant and also sets the scope for more detailed controlled discussions, identifies efficiencies at a risk level and allows risks to be prioritized. So kind of uh, just going into the output a little bit, the overall, I mean, overall, the output would really is to ensure appropriate risk coverage for the organization, uh, specifically identifying new potential compliance and operational risks, existing risks that can be made operational or not key, existing risks that could be removed as they do not mitigate uh, a SOX or operational risk, or finally, you know, the consolidation of risks. Uh, for example, the internal audit function may be assessing risks to plan its audits for the year. The finance function may look at similar information to form its risk-based scoping for SOX compliance, and business units may also be assessing risks. Uh, really, it is important to understand what risks impact SAP processes and whether these can be merged to minimize redundancy. So, leading on to the next phase, which is the risk and controls alignment. This phase is where the existing control framework is mapped to the updated risk assessment, whether it be ITGCs or, for example, the, the P2P control framework. The aim is to better align risk coverage, identifying stronger, more pervasive controls. It is important to kind of take note that any proposed changes should be vetted 
um, with a, an external order b before kind of making any formal changes. And what we typically see is organizations focused on the actual number of controls in, uh, instead of the right controls that will mitigate the risk. Also, the reverse mapping of controls to risk rather than the risk driving the controls. So our recommendation focused on taking that top-down approach, starting with the risk and saying what are the appropriate controls required to effectively mitigate that risk. Furthermore, in some instances, we see access controls not aligned with the risk and controls frameworks. This exercise can be utilized as, a found, as the foundation and provide the opportunity to effectively integrate segregation duties and sensitive access within the overall control environment. For example, building an SOD and sensitive access rule set that accurately maps uh, to the organization's risks and controls. Uh, by scoping only relevant risks into the rule set ensures that the output of a GRC tool provides relevant and accurate information to management. So the value in doing this, uh, I mean, as, as, uh, as on the slide, I mean, it's the control framework provides better risk coverage. Controls which no longer mitigate risk can be eliminated, and controls which only mitigate operational risk can be removed from compliance scope. Basically, both reduce compliance overhead or reduce level of effort associated with performing or testing uh, controls. Um, it can also identify opportunities for single control to address multiple risks or regulatory requirements, uh, pretty much eliminating duplication. Um, finally, uh, I mean, it can be utilized as a template uh, to achieve effective coverage in other areas. A good lesson I have learned from this entire exercise really is to gain consensus from all stakeholders, stakeholders being finance, internal and external audit. This is essential to kind of unlock the benefits of, of, of this phase and facilitate, you know, acceptance of the 2B control environment. Okay, so uh, the output. I mean, really, controls which could be, should be eliminated or consolidated, new controls um, to consider to mitigate new SOX risks, existing controls that can be made not key for compliance objectives and controls for potential removal as they do not mitigate a SOX or operational risk. Okay, and then the next phase, this is the automation of controls and streamlining of processes. Uh, the objective really of this phase is to identify ways in which the controls and processes can be optimized in order to introduce efficiency and effectiveness. As previously highlighted, uh, this phase can run in parallel with phase two, uh, but uh, I mean, for me personally, this is the exciting bit because you really replace inefficient processes and controls with, with those which lower total cost of ownership. Um, this, uh, yeah, the, uh, this is often through automation, but I, I really must highlight that improvements are not always necessarily achieved through, opt uh, through automation. Uh, you know, these can include re reduction in manual controls, better use of system generated reports, improved workflow management, and strong access control and segregation of duties. Hence why phase two and phase three are uh, really so closely linked. Uh, but also, as the recommendations identified in this uh, phase will require changes, an ROI per recommendation could be calculated to allow management to start thinking about the business case and which recommend, recommendations they would like to implement first. Uh, I mean, developing this, David is going to um, touch upon later in the, uh, uh, later in the webcast. So in, in terms of what we typically see, uh, you know, controls governance not being linked or aligned with technology, a misunderstanding of how GRC tools can help, um, and, uh, and the business case not being tangible. So what is recommended is a comprehensive assessment of the processes and controls to identify areas to automate, either, uh, either by leveraging existing technology or by potentially introducing new technologies. I think the key to this is understanding, really understanding the processes and controls. Uh, this is critical in, in identifying opportunities for automation. Uh, also understanding the technological capabilities of your current tools and understanding what tools are available on the market that can support automation. Okay, also consider starting with a pilot process. I mean, this has advantages such as allowing for prototyping approach and starting with a smaller investment. Uh, and enabling the development of a business case with real achieved business savings. 
kind of uh, the key considerations for selecting this process should be, you know, is the controls rationalization complete? Is it a risky process for the business? Uh, you know, is it known to be inefficient or prone to control issues? And, you know, has it got good integration with IT compliance? But, you know, the advantages of performing this exercise is, you know, increased control and process efficiencies enabled through automation and continuous monitoring. This could lead to a, a reduction in time to operate processes uh, and the controls, a reduction in hours to evaluate the current control framework, a reduction in the hours to evaluate the controls by switching testing from sample base to a review of configuration, for example, reduction in the likelihood of errors, and also potential, you know, a reduction in the issues identified and evaluated for controls that are made non-key. Um, so, I mean, the output um, really is... Hey, Jonathan, Jonathan ju oh, just, just before you do the output, I, I need to jump in and do a, um, a, a poll question because of the time. Um, so if I can ask everyone at, at their company, have you already initiated a governance risk and compliance program? Um, a, yes. B, no, we're planning to, or C, no, and have plans not uh, have plans have no plans to do so. Uh, and whilst whilst we're um, giving you a minute to answer that that question, uh, David, uh, I'm going to ask you a, a quick question that's come in in, in the chat. Uh, what is on average the percentage of additional audit costs for automated controls? Okay. Yep. Thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, t typically in terms of the cost of the audit, um, if if you're implementing, you know, if you're switching from manual to automated controls, um, and initially on that first audit, you know, they, they're going to have to look at it because it's new, um, and so that you know there there may be some incremental effort just because you've changed your control environment. They're going to try and assess the design of the control and and all the different conditions to make sure the automated control is working as you expect, but. Once they, they do that, um, auditors can, can leverage a baseline approach where um, they don't have to test at the same um, degree of frequency as you often do for manual control. So in the, in the long run, um, you, you really should save on the audit um, as you automate more controls because um, the, just the nature of the automated controls and the, the ability to use a baseline approach by the auditors, um, it, it, it's, it's less documentation. You know, you're not collecting months and months um, of, of sample data or the daily control, um, you know, daily data um, of samples of 30 to, to 40 instances. Um, and, and then the only other thing I would add in, in addition to that, too, is there are, there are a lot of these tools that we talked about, especially early on um, on that technical capability slide, um, they can actually help automate the testing of the automated controls, um, which is which is pretty neat. So um, they can, and, and what we mean by that is if you know we take a setting, for example, the tool can just monitor that setting in the system and notify you when it changes, rather than an auditor having to go in every so often and, and validate that the setting is still set as we would expect it to be. Great, thanks, David. So if I just quickly look at the results of this poll question. Um, it, clearly, most people have already initiated a, a GRC program, uh, and as I said before, on the back of the last the, the, the last question, uh, a lot of companies uh, have already done something around security and segregation of duties, and, and are now looking to take that a little bit further. Uh, so that's great. Uh, so, Jonathan, if you want to take us back and carry on, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, apologies about that. Um, okay, so moving into the next phase of GRC technology enablement. Um, just to just to mention that you know the output of the um, controls optimization. There is examples in there, and uh, you know if, if you want to take a look at the deck after the call, then um, after the webcast, then then please, if you've got any questions, uh, reach out. But in terms of um, uh, the uh, uh, this um, technology, so. What we are, uh, what this, so 
in essence, you've recognized your risks. You've realigned your controls to those risks and identified opportunities for automation and kind of begun that business case. So what's next? Well, now it's time to uh, turn your focus to GRC technology. And GRC technology is, is kind of a critical enabler of effectively and efficiently executing the processes which support your overall security risks and um, controls environment. So what, uh, so what have we seen? I mean, systems and functionality selected before requirements are actually defined, and this tends to, be, to, to result with them being under, underutilized. Traditionally, organizations adopted tools as a quick resolution to immediate issue. For example, implementing an access monitoring tool to resolve an audit issue. And consequence, uh, consequently, the, the broader application of GRC and ROI were not always considered or realized. Next is biting off more than you can chew. Um, so undertaking a large-scale project, introducing functionality which requires significant effort to support, but really delivers little value to the organization. Then finally, unrealistic expectations from the tooling. And basically, our, our recommendation is to take the risk and controls environment um, or the work performed in prior phases and to plot out the requirements of the organization and understand the types of technology you need. Utilize this to develop a multi-year roadmap integrating all elements of the program, including technology, to help visualize the path forward. Key elements to consider here are a kind of licensing cost, implementation cost, current leverage of, of uh, you know, the existing tools and proposed leverage of, of, um, you know, of new tools. So, yeah, I mean, and also take into consideration that GRC maturity piece. Yeah, um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, what, um, what uh, the value is, is really an increased return on investment by the way of expanding existing technologies and their functional use. And also in terms of new technologies, potentially operational, finance, and regulatory compliance efficiencies. Yeah. And based on the organization's requirements, uh, then a, a capabilities assessment can then be performed helping an organization appraise its strengths and weaknesses of current implement te uh, implemented technologies and understand where are the gaps in those requirements whereby new technologies could be introduced. The diagram illustrates, I mean, uh, it's a little bit simple, but what this could look like. And then once the enhancements required for existing technologies and required new technologies have been identified, you know, these can be converted into actions which are prioritized and sequenced to support effective integration. Consideration should be given to return on investment, you know, the, uh, and uh, the, the issues that actions or technologies re uh, could resolve, and also, you know, the impact to, uh, to the organization introducing these technologies may have. So, I mean, the output, a business case, again, David, to discuss in more detail a little bit later, a phased technological roadmap, and also a, a, a target operating model for GRC. You know, this provides a high-level framework of what the future business as usual processes, the roles, responsibilities, tasks, and, and also the systems will look like um, f uh, functionally within the organization. You know, the, the target operating model should really be fit for purpose and, line, and align with the, with the requirements of the business. So the final step, step five, is the GRC program maintenance uh, phase. And really, uh, you know, establishing the GRC maintenance program for business as usual is uh, it, it's it's important to note that a robust program is critical for ensuring consistent use and uh, and application of the GRC technology an effective application of the GRC technology following implementation. Examples of this program could look like you know the policies and procedures to embed these technologies. Uh, the protocols to incorporate new risks, controls, and, and, the, uh, and, and uh, in the business, and also IT management procedures for new technologies. I mean, the value here is that it will enable you to sustain an effective and efficient GRC environment and reduces the likelihood for reassessment and redesign in future years. Okay, so um, another uh, piece we wanted to bring up of, of this roadmap is ownership. And ownership is, is a critical 
piece of the GRC program. But who owns what really depends on the organization. You know, the groups who are typically involved in this program are a compliance team, uh, the business, IT, and internal audit. But, you know, if the compliance team exists within the organization and is separate from the internal audit team, then typically they will take ownership as responsible for identifying the risk and driving compliance throughout the organization. The business, though, typically has ownership of the processes and controls that have been designed. Hence, their involvement is crucial. Finance even more so because of financial controls. And we have seen that the finance teams drive, uh, sometimes drive the GRC program because they care about compliance and financial reporting. IT, you know, they typically own the enhancements and, you know, the implementation of GRC technologies and, you know, also the, the support related to these. And then finally, internal audit. You know, they're responsible for ensuring the controls are operating effectively and, and that they meet regulatory requirements. So naturally, they will also have an involvement. And with that being said, you know, I, I, I'm going to flip it over to Jamie. Actually, we've done that polling question, so it'll run straight on to David to talk about the business case. Yep, yep I'm here, Jamie. Okay, so we'll just skip through this polling question. I think we've already done it. Um, bear with us for one second. Okay, so building a business case um, is, is what we wanted to hit on next. So um, in today's world, uh, Obviously, um, our, our risks and our uh, the complexities with the regulations that the companies need to adhere to um, things are just getting more and more complex. There's there's more and more regulation, um, so there's obviously a need. And I don't think anyone would argue with the fact that there's a need for better technology uh, that supports stronger automated controls. Um, what we often see is that um, you know the, the investments in these technologies can be um, sizable. Um, and while it's easy to say uh, the company should invest in it, it also can be challenging to quantify the benefits. Um, much of that is just because there's so much uncertainty, um, and really uncertainty is an inherent part of, of avoiding risk. So um, what, we, what we often see is companies get uh, you know, into the budgeting process and different projects are competing against each other in that process, and there's a, a you know, as there always should be, there's a focus on the, the financial return of, of the different initiatives that are on the table for the annual plan. And so um, it's not an uncommon thing where um, the, the project doesn't make it through. Um, so what, what the reason we wanted to, to focus on the business case is just because um, what, what we've seen it in some cases is that, is that there isn't a proper um, focus or emphasis on building a strong business case for such initiatives. Um, and, and, and a lot of that is just because it, a, a lot of what goes into it is, is somewhat subjective. Um, and so uh, today we just want to lay out in this section a, a little bit of a framework that you can consider as um, you try and perhaps consider building a business case uh, to, to maybe take your company to the next level in terms of its GRC technical capabilities. Okay, so um, the basic steps to building a business case is, is just where we wanted to start. Um, and, and most of this, once again, it's um, not rocket science. Uh, the first thing you want to do is, is in, in your business case, is uh, define the opportunity. Um, you then want to identify different options to demonstrate that, you know, you, you are considering um, uh, different possibilities and that, you, you know, you're not just sort of stuck on, on one solution and, and haven't done your homework on what other potential good solutions may be. Um, so once you define your, your options, you're going to gather information and you're going to analyze that information. Um, and then you're going to basically decide what option makes the most sense for the company. Um, and so then usually a part of the business case, there's also um, a section where you actually call out what the risks of, of such an undertaking would be. Um, and you create a high-level implementation plan. And then you present your business case. Um, so the, the one piece of this that we're going to focus on today is uh, when you're gathering your information and you're analyzing it, uh, just making sure that um, the homework has been done in terms of the, the financial metrics that you want to include in your business case. Um, and so the typical financial matrix are um, the payback period, the net present value, and the return on investment. And so we're going to sort of focus on the, the ROI side of it today and, and just 
kind of take you through the three basic steps of sort of building out a financial model um, that can support an investment um, in GRC technology so that you can take it to the next level. Hey, David, before you go into the models, um, we're going to ask a polling question to, to see where people are um, with, the, uh, w with their business cases. Um, so has a business case been submitted at your organization before, and if so, what was the result? So yes, you've submitted a business case, uh, and it was approved. Yes, you've submitted a business case, but it was rejected. Or no, you've not submitted a business case. Um, so sort of helpful to know that before, and then David's going to run through um, what, uh, yeah, how, to, how to build a business case or what the components are for a business case to, to help it get approved. Um, whilst, whilst we're waiting for the answers to this to come in, um, what, one of the questions that, that came in earlier um, was about how this exercise integrates with existing legacy systems interface with SAP. So uh, with what Jonathan was talking about, the, the section that you, where, you, where you walk through and look at what GRC can do, you, you would be looking at all of your environment as it, as it relates to any, uh, any area of compliance that needs to be covered. So you know, primarily we're looking at SOCs here in the US, but you've got PCI, you've got NERC and FERC, depending on you know, whether you're in sort of a utilities uh, type industry. And, and lots of other regulations, banking regulations, et cetera. Um, so you would cover that. And then there are, you know, when we talked about looking at, at the program, before we get into that section four, which is looking at the GRC technology that, that, and, and how that can better enable you, that's where you would do a system selection. If you've sort of identified your risks, where you can automate the controls in your existing technology, and then you're looking for how you can get better leverage from either an SAP GRC solution or one of the other competitors that I mentioned, that would be an appropriate time to look at that. And then you can look at what other platforms you needed to cover. There are, you know, connectors by, you know, SAP has a, a connector with a company called Greenlight that, that enables you to connect to legacy systems to, to pull in data and do do analytics. And the, the other the other providers also have other means of uh, of, of doing GRC analytics on, on other legacy systems. Okay. So if I just put the results through. So the majority of people haven't submitted a business case, um, uh, but those that have did get it approved, which is great. Um, because um, that, that it's very demoralizing when you put the effort into to creating a business case and it gets, gets rejected. Um, but David's going to continue and go through and talk about some of the financial elements to, to put forward in that business case. So David, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Okay, so um, like we mentioned, there's, there's three pretty basic steps. So um, step one is honestly probably the most difficult of the three steps. Uh, so we'll hit that first and maybe spend a little bit more time on this one. But um, step one is to estimate the monetary benefits of um, implementing additional automated uh, control capabilities in, in your system. So in, in just to you know, kind of put out an example of what we're talking about, for example, implementing SAP GRC process controls, for example. So um, you know, the, the first thing that, that you really need to do is sort of define the benefit areas. Um, so what you see on the screen here, there's there's two examples listed, and this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, this is really just meant to sort of show an example and what the format looks like. But, um, you know, the first one is continuous monitoring. And, and so under that, um, you know, we call out things like cost savings um, by enabling uh, continuous control monitoring on existing controls, cost savings by converting manual controls to automated um, resulting in reduced operational costs associated with execution of controls. Um, and then, you know, we've got a third bucket down there. So we're basically sort of bucketing off um, the different numbers. And, and so we'll get into this in just a second, because obviously then you see in each of the yearly um, columns to the right there some, some pretty decent-sized numbers. So um, I'm sure everybody's wondering, well, how, how do you get to those numbers and where do those come from? Um, and the short answer is, is that you have to develop assumptions to get there. Um, so we'll, we'll show some examples of that um, on the next slide. But, but before we do that, 
just to give everybody an idea, you know, we're showing sort of two of the domains here in which you might want to try and bucket or define your benefits, one being continuous control monitoring, and then the second being data analytics. Um, the other ones that um, we sometimes try and define out, um, it would be um, reduction in um, audit costs from internal and external audit, um, replacement of legacy systems, so in some cases, um, like for example, if you already have um, one product from a vendor like say SAP Access Controls, you may have actually already be paying for the license, um, and that's it's completely company specific in terms of how your license has been worked out. There's no hard and fast rules around it, but you may be already paying for the license for say process controls. Um, and so maybe, you know, there is no incremental licensing cost in some situations to implement something because you already have part of the solution and then maybe there's a, another older solution that then you can retire and save on the licensing costs. Um, uh, another uh, bucket that we typically see is um, in just increased compliance team efficiency through um, better reporting uh, so that the reporting is going to be centralized. There's issue management resolution. Um, as a part of that, and then you know, the semi-automation of manual controls, and also um, you can leverage such solutions to really drive standardization across your organization, uh, the fiscal global, global organization. And then the last benefit area, which is probably the most objective, is uh, just what we call enhanced assurance, um, which is sometimes referred to as you know risk avoidance. So it, it's hard um, a lot of times to estimate that, um, just because it, it's the future, and you don't know what of your risks are going to come to fruition. But um, one thing we've we've seen companies do is actually just look back at the say their past um, uh, financial year and say, okay, what issues did we have to deal with from an you know maybe a controls or audit perspective last year? How much time did we spend on them? What was the root cause of the issue? If we had had an automated solution in place, could we have avoided that issue? And what would have been the dollar savings of avoiding that issue in terms of maybe the number of hours spent? Um, times the, the company's internal rate or um, maybe on even on external hours. So that's that's really just meant to, to give everybody an idea of sort of how to define out your benefits. Um, like I mentioned, we did want to just kind of talk through how you get to these numbers. So typically you need to develop some assumptions around um, each of the areas. So maybe, um, you know, internal audit testing time may be able to be reduced if we implement control. So maybe we make an assumption that it's eight hours annually per control. Um, so you can basically just build out in, in a pretty basic spreadsheet, um, you know, what the the, hour, the dollar savings is if, if you're able to reduce um, reduce the, the number of hours you're spending across all of your controls, you know, kind of taking these cuts across the board. So this is very uh, subjective. You know, it's one trap we see companies fall into is they try to start to get extremely precise with it. It's, it's good to be somewhat precise, but, um, what we recommend is just be collaborative with others. So rather than you know putting these numbers together in a box and then putting them in front of someone and then someone really starting to dig in and question them, work work with your colleagues, work with other stakeholders. You know if you're in corporate internal controls, go get with someone in internal audit and and build out the model together and agree on the assumptions together so that when it's communicated out, um, you have you have um, several people standing behind how the numbers were put together. So moving on. Um, Really, we're going to just kind of go through this next section quickly. This this is just laying out the costs, which are typically pretty standard um, in, in terms of what you would see. We have, you know, your licensing costs, um, your maintenance costs, your consulting costs from a from a vendor possibly. Uh, we have the infrastructure-related costs, and then we have um, your implementation costs. And so then the final step is to just put all of this together um, into a cash flow statement, step three. So. You basically want to take what your savings were that you calculated in step one across the years um, and subtract out what the costs were from step two to, to basically um, calculate out what the benefit is. And I know we're getting short on time, so I'll, I'll uh, with that, turn it back over to you, Jonathan. I guess, Thanks, I'm sorry, I've got... One more slide, Jonathan, here. You know, these are just some lessons learned we wanted to call out. I think we've hit on some of these already as I've talked through them. But um, just knowing your audience, uh, like we did mention, cross-functional support is, is important. Um, you know, if, if you're in corporate internal controls and you're estimating benefits for, say, internal audit, make sure you go engage with internal audit. And um, 
that that they agree with what you put together. So those types of things. Most of this is common sense, um, but just just some things that we've seen. I, I think the only other one worth mentioning on here is going and talking to other companies that have undergone a similar effort. Oftentimes, when you present your business case, being able to say that you've done that just adds a lot of credibility to what what you're trying to get the company to do. Yeah. So sorry, John. I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, David. Okay, so now we're just going to touch on uh, the project approaches for a GRC program. Um, so basically, there are um, uh, there are two types of approaches for the GRC program: the pilot approach and the big bra big bang approach. Just a quick note on the slides. You know, these diagrams in particular, the timing, are really for illustration purposes only. And uh, you know, the timing would you know, spread out over months, years, you know, the less automated um, the environment is. But uh, in, in essence, the, the pilot is, is simply uh, selecting a smaller portion of the overall project, a process, for example, such as uh, P2P. And this approach can be utilized, so to speak, to test the assumptions J David just uh, walked through and to try out the project approach, you know, developing a, 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 a really a template for the rest of the project. If the organization is skeptical, in particular, of, of the value a project like this can deliver, you can use, utilize this approach to prove, um, you know, real achieved business uh, business savings. Okay, the other uh, the other type of approach is the Big Bang approach, and the Big Bang approach, whereby all respective processes are changed and and technology is implemented in one project. I mean, really, the overarching benefit is that it will cost less. I mean, efficiencies will be introduced during the program. As for example, you'll be only performing workshops at at, at the same time. So, yeah, there's um, there's really advantages of, of of either, and it really depends on your organisation. So, Jamie, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. And we're going to wrap up with that, the, uh, the final polling question. I, I do see a number of uh, comments coming in. Uh, we actually just jumped over uh, the prior polling question, which is why it may, may have appeared to have uh, jumped on the screen. But this is the final polling question for CPE. So for those of you who have been through a GRC program, what, what was the, the preferred approach? Which approach did you take? And if you didn't, your answers, if you haven't actually gone through a GRC program, your answer will be C. So A is a pilot approach, B is the Big Bang approach, and C, uh, we've not done one yet. So if we can just, uh, just finish up with that. We've had a, a number of questions also come in uh, related to technology and questions around multiple GRC tools. Um, and I think David uh, touched on this in that section with the, that he was looking at uh, when he was talking about building the business case. Um, you know, and we've sort of talked about where in the program you would look at uh, deciding if you wanted to implement change at all or anything like that. But if you already have existing technologies, and, and David covered this, you know, a lot of companies we go out to already have one or more GRC tool in place that may already be meeting or have the capabilities to meet all of those compliance needs. So I think you know, it's important to understand when you enter this program, you know, what, is, what is your current state? Where, where are you starting from? And there may be components of the organization like health and safety that, that have actually acquired a tool that has broader capabilities than, than just what they're looking at it for that you, that you may be able to take advantage of when you go into one of these programs. So, um, with that, um, we're not going to have time to answer any more questions at the end, um, but uh, we will answer all the other questions that have come in. I'm going to just go through the results of this last poll. Um, so uh, I think tied into um, the, the previous responses, a lot of folks haven't actually gone, haven't actually started the program yet. Uh, a lot of people have, uh, are going with a pilot approach, and it is actually very interesting. I think. When I look at uh, sort of how I've, I've seen uh, GRC be expanded through organizations, and I've referred to this many times, that a lot of companies have started with a GRC tool to look at security and segregation of duties, and then are saying, how can we take this a little bit further? You know, what else can this tool do for us? You know, building in a control repository, doing some of the um, automated control testing and things like that. Um, Initially, people were going on, on the Big Bang, so I think a lot of the early adopters went with a Big Bang approach. Right now, most people that I'm talking to are really looking at, you know, what truly is the business case for this? 
can I prove out the business case? And I think, you know, one of the things we see is like if you build um, the, the business case how David described, you know, taking some assumptions, that helps you get an idea of where you're going to get those cost savings from. Then if you take a, a pilot approach, it helps you determine whether you can realize those benefits before you actually go full force and, and, and disrupts other parts of the organization. So pilot approaches do seem to be more popular and they do seem to enable companies to, to be more comfortable that this program is going to continue to realize benefits as they progress. So with that, I'll run through uh, the, 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 the last remaining slides. Um, so here's the, in the slides you've got, got my contact details as well as Jonathan and David. Um, and then, uh, you know, thank, a big thank you to everybody for joining. We do have um, our upcoming webcast series. Everybody who's been on this webcast will get an invite to the to the future uh, webcast, and hopefully you'll be able to join that. Our, our next topics we're looking at uh, securing GRC, so we're going to probably look uh, more in detail at SAP security. Um, uh, and, and, and do a webcast on that topic. So thank you very much everybody for joining and that concludes today's webcast.